So I'm going to uh, cap off the day with a little discussion about clinical virtual reality and its use for treatment of anxiety disorders and post-traumatic stress. And what I'll try to do is provide a quick introduction to what VR is all about and why we're so excited about it, and uh, then talk about anxiety disorders, simple phobias, and so forth, the VR application in that area, talk about PTSD exposure therapy, and some of the other projects that have spun off from that, and then a little bit of a conclusion on the future of VR. So um, also, just to mention, if anybody's interested in uh, a lot of the content that I'll be presenting today, this article is sort of like the album of the live version. So uh, you can send me an email, and I can send you a copy of that. Um, our work takes place at the University of Southern California Institute for Creative Technologies. Uh, we're part of USC, but we're also an Army UARC, a university-affiliated research center. The Army has a number of these around the country, and they wanted to have one in LA that specifically focused on virtual reality, uh, and they wanted it in LA because they wanted to tap into the Hollywood talent and uh, game development, graphics, narrative, uh, and so forth. So. Um, they picked USC, and so in that building, we're sort of like the unholy alliance between Hollywood, the military, and academia. Three completely different cultures, uh, but somehow we get along and, uh, and we build, uh, I think, kind of cool stuff. So our lab's the MedVR lab, and over the years, we started it actually in 1996, um, back in the Stone Age of VR. Uh, and Basically, um, the work's evolved to address psych, cognitive, motor, and virtual human applications. I'll just show a couple of these real quick. Whoa, that's not supposed to happen. Let's back it up. There we go. That's what I'll be talking about in a little bit. Um, simulation of Iraq and Afghanistan that we use for combat-related PTSD exposure therapy. Um, we'll skip over that for now because you'll see more of it later. That's what it looked like 10 years ago. So you can see the advances in graphics that has taken place uh, during, you know, over the last few years. Um, and in this case, what we did was we developed a set of cognitive tests within the same simulation that we use for exposure therapy. So tests of attention, memory, executive function, all within an immersive VR environment. Uh, we don't just do military work. This is an app that we developed um, back in 97, I think. Uh, for looking at visual spatial abilities, so mental rotation in this case, but also depth perception, eye-hand coordination, and so forth. Uh, another cognitive app is Virtual Classroom, developed for testing kids with attention deficit or other <coughs> attention impairments. Um, and in this case, that's what the child sees in a head-mounted display. Uh, they have to pay attention to what's going on on the blackboard. Uh, respond to a certain sequence, but meanwhile, distractions like the teacher walking around or a kid through just through a paper <coughs> airplane, uh, looking out the window. And it's a way to test attention in a very controlled and, and relevant environment. And we can also tell because of the head tracking if a child's looking out the window and missing a target or looking at the target and missing it. Uh, two completely different types of attention uh, errors, loss of focus, distractibility. <coughs> Um, we also have done work with um, post-stroke or traumatic brain injury rehabilitation, uh, trying to develop game-based applications, this, in this case using a Microsoft Connect to track the user's movement um, and to embed that user's activity in a game-like context so maybe people will do the rehab uh, more consistently or more of it uh, and reacquire their function. Taking that same technology, we've developed uh, systems uh, for kids with cerebral palsy. And in this case, um, the request was to make it so kids with extreme motor impairments could just simply play video games. So in this case, this child's only movement that she had real volitional control was this lifting of her hand. So we track that movement and that becomes, uh, emulates the action of a game pad to make the shark jump out of the water and so forth. And we built a whole series of these kind of games. Uh, basically the first time this little girl ever played a video game. Um, in the virtual human front, uh, we've done a lot of work with, in different clinical applications. The one I'm gonna show here is a system we built for the USC School of Social Work. It's a virtual patient system. 
um, and it'll be apparent when it runs. Good afternoon, Sergeant Castilla. What brings you in today? Well, my wife told me she thought I should talk to someone. She's been pretty concerned about me since a soldier suicide on base last week. Did you happen to know the soldier? Yes. He wasn't a friend, but I met the Marine once or twice. He seemed normal at the time. I guess I'm afraid I might end up like him. Do you have any plans to hurt yourself? No. It certainly caught my mind, especially lately. I just need it all to stop. Sometimes I can't handle it. So I like to say in this application, that's from 2012. That system has now been evolved. The character looks a lot more real and higher level of uh, voice recognition and natural language processing. But um, I like to say that, you know, in some sense, it gives novice clinicians a chance to screw up a bunch with a virtual patient before they get their hands on a live one. Um, and as a clinical psychologist going through training in 1985, um, you know, I could have used that. I mean, basically, you know, you go your first year, you read a few books on therapy, take a couple classes, maybe you role play with a grad student, and then you're thrown into the office and uh, you start seeing patients. Um, Sim Coach, this was a character we developed for the Army as an online healthcare support agent. So service members, veterans, family members, folks that don't want to go see a shrink, don't know if they really have a problem, they can go online and privately interact with this guy and ask questions about PTSD. He could ask questions back uh, that were thinly veiled screening questions and at some point he might say, hey, you know, looks like you're going through a heap of trouble. Um, you know, if you want, uh, I, I can pop up um, a website and you can punch in your zip code and a list of providers in your area will, will turn up. And it's a way to break down barriers to care, to maybe a toe in the water towards um, getting the help that they can benefit from. And I'll just, since I'm not gonna talk ab about this in any detail, just let him introduce himself here. Well, I'm not a real person, if that's what you're asking but I'm based on the personality and experiences of real soldiers and Marines. I'm still just a piece of software, but I'm getting better all the time. So hopefully I can be a helpful piece of software to talk to. And that, this now has been translated into um, other areas. USC uh, Counseling Center now is developing an app on this technology and uh, similar approach for uh, breaking down barriers to care. Now, we talk about um, virtual reality, we can look at it from a technological perspective, a uh, collection of technologies, computing, display technology, interface devices, uh, software, of course. Um, I prefer the more human-centric definition, which is really about human-computer interaction, ways to make it so people can interact with computers or software in a more natural and intuitive way. Um, and if we look back at HCI over the years, maybe it's time we take advantage of the power in these little boxes uh, to, to do things beyond interacting with a mouse and a keyboard. Um, best metaphor for VR in the mental health or rehab fields, medicine generally, um, is aviation simulation. So just as an aircraft simulator would serve to test and train piloting ability, we can test, train, teach, and treat psych, cognitive, motor, functioning in a range of controllable conditions. It's like the ultimate Skinner box, if you will. Um, when we think about VR, sometimes a good way of conceptualizing it is the three eyes, immersion, interactivity, and imagination. You don't always need all three, but you need at least two. So when we talk about immersion, here's an example, wearing a head-mounted display. What the user sees in that headset as they turn and look around is what you're seeing in the background. And it includes the person from the outside world, puts them in the virtual world. Um, we can also do other things, like in this case, if this video will start up. Um, we have a sensor on the front of the headset that's tracking the hands. And now you have first person interaction with good high fidelity finger tracking um, in a virtual environment with objects in an immersive space. And we developed a whole series of these types of um, game-like activities for upper extremity uh, rehabilitation. In this case, bimanual coordination and finger pointing, fractionization, supination, pronation, things like that. Um, now, it doesn't always have to be immersive. It can be highly interactive and still be VR, but not immersive. So in this case, 
This is a balance training activity where again, uh, Connect like sensor is tracking users' movement side to side. As she does that, Penguin goes along with her. If she leans forward, it goes fast, lean back, it slows down. And basically imagine an elderly person, of course, in a safety harness, practicing shifting their weight like this as a method for fall prevention. Uh, but you can see it's in the lab. You know, you're not immersed in a world. You're simply interacting with 3D content in a natural way. And it doesn't always have to be on a big screen either. If you build engaging content, people interact with it, even on a small screen. Um, and finally, with interactivity, um, interacting with virtual humans. Um, it doesn't always have to be in a headset. We do some of this work in immersive VR, but you can do it on a TV. Uh, and this is one that we developed for high-functioning people on the autism spectrum working with the Dan Marino Foundation where basically it's a job interview trainer. So you've got six characters, uh, you know, a bunch of different backdrops to set the context, and each character has three um, personalities. You can set them to be soft touch, neutral, or son of a uh, cranky interviewer. Um, and so here's... I'm glad you're here. Soft touch. In a minute, we'll get into some questions about the job. But before we do, why don't you just tell me about yourself? So you can practice your interview with her in that mode, or you can make her cranky, or uh, put a different backdrop, in a, you know, restaurant job, a warehouse, whatever. Or you can change up the character. This is an entry-level position. I guarantee there will be things you won't like about this job. That said, what's the most important thing you think you're looking for in a job? So in this case, it's kind of like a mix of skill training, but also exposure therapy, because people on the spectrum oftentimes get very anxious dealing with real people. But they seem to be attracted to interacting with these uh, kinds of characters. And I think I have a video of a actual um, user in a second here. These are some of the different characters in the backdrops. That's Dan. He sponsored the work. Um, let's see. Oh, we already saw that. This it's is a an entry-level position. Hold on. I guarantee we there got, will be things you won't like this about first, this job. Sorry. That said, what's the most important thing you think you're looking for in a job? Okay, here we go. It's a good program, and it teaches you how to do an interview, and it teaches you how to be in an interview situation with another, with another person. And did you see your performance improve? Did it, you get better? I get, I, get, I get better. Every single time I do it, I get better. So that's data from a study showing uh, pre-training, live interview rated by uh, two vocational counselors, post-training, and progressive improvements over time. And this being used with veterans now and with people about to be uh, paroled so they can practice how they're going to represent themselves uh, in a job interview. Um, you know, back in, you know, there was a big heyday in VR back in the early 90s, just like there is today. The only difference back then, the technology was not mature enough to deliver on the vision. The vision was sound, but, uh, you know, head-mounted displays were horrible. Computing wasn't fast enough. Computer graphics was, weren't, wasn't really that good. Um, but this guy, Myron Kruger, one of the early godfathers, I think, got it right, especially in mental health. The idea, we're not just automating paradigms of the past, we're creating new paradigms that leverage this immersion and high level of natural interaction. Um, and uh, if we look back in the early 90s, a lot of work got started then, particularly, actually, uh, the field got driven by exposure therapy for people with anxiety disorders, specific phobias, and so forth. Um, and since that time, this is a short list of some of the clinical conditions where VR has been scientifically documented to add value either as an assessment tool, a treatment tool, or a tool for scientific research. Uh, so the field has come along in spite of the nuclear winter that occurred around 96, 97, when everybody you know, saw VR as a failed technology. A lot of people continued to focus on it and to do what we could at the time with the limitations of the technology. And consequently, now that technology is caught up with the vision, um, you know, we probably have the largest, most evolved scientific literature of any VR use case in mental health and in, in rehabilitation as well. Um, so exposure therapy. This is an approach that um, is an evidence-based 
approach to treating um, simple phobias and so forth. Um, basically, you know, it's kind of a brain dead approach. It's basically make somebody confront what they're fearful of, uh, what they typically avoid. And we're not talking about realistically dangerous settings. We're talking about things where there's an irrational fear. And by a process of extinction learning, by confronting your fear and realizing there's no threat, by doing that repeatedly over time, um, you start to see the fear dissipate and the person become more functional in everyday life. Um, and over the years, VR has been applied in, in at least these areas, a couple of other phobias that have popped up that people have started applying it for. But, um, you know, basically, uh, an evolved literature started in 1994 with this, um, and it just made sense because the assets that VR provides, putting somebody in a fearful environment and being able to systematically ramp up the challenge of that, um, but being in a safe environment made a lot of sense. Phobics that would not confront their fears in the real world would do it in VR. And the goal was to say that, well, by confronting it in the, real, in the VR world, the effect would transfer to the real world. That was what the scientific research really uh, tried to show, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so, for example, in 1997, if you had claustrophobia, um, and you were in Spain, you could go to this lab, and they put you in this room, and close the door on you, and then gradually move the wall in on you. Um, fear of heights was um, an area that uh, was such a common phobia, it provided a lot of research participants, and uh, a lot of research was done in this area. And basically, I stopped listening to studies after 2002 because they, it was redundant. Uh, VR outperformed doing it in imagination, which is the standard way to do exposure therapy, guided imagery, and imaginal therapy, um, and was as good as in vivo. And in vivo means the therapist has to go with the person to the real thing, get on a real airplane, or climb up the Eiffel Tower, or whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, so basically the studies pretty much showed you know, success over time. Um, now, the interesting thing was back in 1994, when one of the first studies, the graphics sucked. You would never mistake that for the real thing. But the good news was, and people thought that would be, a, you know, the limitation here. The good news was people with phobias, it doesn't take much to activate them. That's what you want. You want to activate that fear and have them confront it and find out nothing bad happens. Um, and, uh, and so even something as primitive as this, got the heart rate going, the sweaty palms, and so forth. Um, one group out of Atlanta developed a virtual glass elevator that was modeled after the glass elevator at the Marriott Hotel in Atlanta, so you could bring a patient to the real glass elevator before treatment, try to jam them in there and say, go up, and typically they wouldn't. Um, and then do the VR exposure and then go back to the behavioral analog at the end of treatment. And here's what that looked like. And All right, I think we've got a virtual junction. That's right. Here. here we go. That's pretty fast. Wow, whoa, look at that. Wow. Oh, that's great. Do you want to dangle your foot over the edge? How does that feel? Feels pretty good. With the price of computing power coming down fast, it won't be long until virtual reality systems could be cheap enough for every therapist to have one in their office. 20 years later. And it will become even harder to tell where the virtual world ends and the real one begins. Whoa, whoa. Oh, oh, wait. Very good. You know, that is really something. I've had my eye on the floor. <laughs> and the floor really came up at me. Well, it's the motion. In the Don't do this at home, right. kids. Anyway, you might have been hamming it up a little, but you get the idea that even in spite of the graphic limitations, people got activated and with repeated exposure, they got better. Um, now, Fear Heights, it's a, a commodity uh, product, basically, um, and you can run it on a standalone headset. You don't even need a computer, a mobile phone enabled headset or something like the Oculus Go where all the processing is done in the headset. Um, you know, and, Here's an example of what, you know, standing on the edge of a building looks like looking down. And I, I like uh, this next application because it kind of pits your fear of heights against your love of kitty cats. You know, you got to go out there and rescue the cat. Um, and 
just last week, this was published where they have a virtual character that's it's actually created from, it's like digital puppetry, but they have somebody wearing a suit and creates a, um, a self-help kind of an approach where characters like a therapist and it helps you to approach, you know, the edge and to do things and, um, uh, you know, it's, I, I'm a little skeptical in some regard uh, because I, I really have a strong belief that a clinician has to be involved in these kinds of treatments, but we kind of give it a pass with, with fear of public speaking, fear of heights, because, you know, everybody's got a little bit of that, but we have to be real careful, even though this study shows good results, um, about having people just run off and make their own diagnosis and figure they can self-treat themselves with content on the internet, even though we want to break down barriers to care and make treatment more accessible, still have to have a certain amount of caution um, in, in this area. And so that'll be a big issue in, in psychology as this stuff advances. Um, fear of flying, another area where you can see 1997, what it looked like, another group in 99, uh, another group in 2000. Um, 2005, this group actually modeled the United Terminal at the San Diego airport. And 2017, you know, the commercial products all over the place in this area. Here's one that runs on a mobile phone. So, you know, when a clinician can open up their desk drawer, take out a headset, give it to a client right there, no need for any complex computing. Um, now you're breaking down a barrier to adoption. Anyway, let's skip through this. Um, so, uh, just real quick, Fear of Spiders, 1997, Hunter Hoffman's work. Filming for that same show that Alan Alda was in, uh, they were filming this woman, her nickname was Miss Muffet because uh, she was so terrified of spiders, she spent an hour and a half every night spraying her bedroom uh, with bug spray, duct taping doors, windows, stuff like that. I mean, really fanatical, and here she is with a Guyan and bird-eating spider on her hand after getting this treatment. Um, other folks over the years have developed um, systems, this one from 2003. Um, I was in this scenario once, uh, and they put it on full bore, spiders everywhere, and uh, I got really creeped out by it, even though I, I, I don't have anything against spiders. Um, it was pretty real. Um, and now using augmented reality where you have see-through glasses, um, you get this illusion here. Yeah, okay. Um, fear of public speaking, as I mentioned, people over the years have done it, and now, um, oh, here's a, here's a commercial app from 2008 where um, you walk into a lecture hall, you look out at the crowd, and they can uh, adjust Eric, the behavior of the crowd. Can you speak crowd. more slowly? Ooh, okay, that's not what you want. Here we go. Yeah. But there's always one in every crowd. Thank you for that clear and concise presentation. Is this the first time you've given this talk? <sighs> Okay, um, but anyway, these things now, these are free. You can download these and run them in a Gear VR on a mobile phone headset. And like I said before, in psychology, you know, we kind of give public speaking a pass, even though it would be classified as an anxiety disorder. We kind of give it a pass because everybody's got a little bit. It's a skill that you develop with practice, so not that big a deal, but now we're moving towards self-help for fear of heights, is it a slippery slope? Are we gonna to start to accept that people can self-diagnose and self-treat for you know, more complex mental health conditions? I think we have to be uh, very careful on that front. Um, but anyway, to sum up the data, our group and another group uh, published a meta-analysis in 2008 showing what I had said before, um, better than uh, marginal exposure, as good as in vivo, uh, same conclusion. Uh, 2012, an updated meta-analysis, same conclusion. And in 2015, the meta-analysis focused on not just did they get better in the treatment and approach things that they wouldn't approach in treatment, but did it matter in the real world? You know, did they start going on air, airline flights or did they, could they go up and, and work on a 30-story building or something like that? Um, so, 
you know, the good news here is that, you know, you can do it cheap, you can do it in a controlled way, it's safe, and it matters for people in the real world. Um, now, PTS, you know, this is something that follows, even though it's been changed in the DS, most recent DSM, uh, it has its own category, not in the anxiety disorder uh, category, um, it's still treated as if it's an anxiety disorder in terms of how we apply exposure therapy, the same principles. And we certainly know that from the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan that we have a significant problem, people that uh, deserve our best attention. Um, and this actually uh, was noted in 2004 um, in this paper and has been continued to be noted in other publications along the way. Um, now, in 2008, I believe, uh, Institute of Medicine reviewed all the treatments for PTSD. And the bad news was most of them, there wasn't any scientific evidence of their value. Uh, the good news, though, was cognitive behavioral therapy with a trauma-focused exposure element did have sufficient evidence to be considered to be evidence-based. Um, so, you know, when we tell people about this, you know, people that, that aren't so familiar with um, behavioral approaches to anxiety, uh, you know, a lot of times they look at you and say, are you crazy? Why would you make somebody go back? Somebody's been traumatized by something. Why would you make somebody go back and face it again? You want to help them forget about it. Well, actually, um, if you study the literature, you see that trauma-focused approaches, whether it's a journal writing or something that activates someone's confrontation and processing of what they went through, actually has the evidence, the, the support. So in this meta-analysis where you looked at, this group looked at people 30 days after trauma that still showed you know, intense behavioral activation and, and uh, you know, emotional uh, difficulty, uh, those are people at risk for chronic PTS. So if you look at those people 30 days out and they don't get any treatment, 76% were later diagnosed with chronic PTS. If you do supportive counseling, don't worry about that stuff that happened in the past. Look ahead, you know, it's gonna get better. You do that kind of supportive counseling, even though you wanna do that anyway as part of a, you know, a comprehensive approach, you wanna have that support and therapeutic alliance. Um, but if you just do that and you don't do, you, you back away from the hard medicine for the hard problem approach with exposure, 67% um, are uh, diagnosed with chronic uh, PTS. With exposure therapy, it's not 100%, but 22% were diagnosed. So, you know, the evidence from multiple studies, different labs, uh, different approaches, but still with that exposure element, uh, shows this to be the best evidence-based approach uh, for treating this. So why do it in VR if it's so good? Well, like I said, it's not 100%, and there's a lot of people that um, don't engage in imagination very well with their trauma memory. I mean, you're basically asking somebody who spent months or years trying not to think about what they went through, you're asking them to do that in imagination. And we don't know what's going on in the hidden world of imagination. So VR makes a case here that you can gradually engage the patient at a pace they can handle and help them confront what they were traumatized by. Um, and we're not the first group to do this. Virtual Vietnam from Barbara Rothbaum's lab in the late 90s, a driving sim for motor vehicle PTS, Joanne DeFiti's group, the World Trade Center, and a group in Israel with bus bombing scenario. Those were all developed between 98 and 2005, 2006. Um, and the early data, small, Studies with Vietnam era vets showed a clinical improvement, but never was funded sufficiently to do large scale randomized control trials. Um, unfortunately, Vietnam era vets continue to get screwed. Um, the World Trade Center work, the first case study showing pretty significant improvements, but then later followed on um, by a weightless control study um, that showed really, really good results in five of the nine treated um, subjects in the, in the VR group um, had tried imaginal exposure with no benefit previously. Here's a little clip on this one. Here's how it works. First, the patient sees the towers as they were before the attacks. Then a plane appears and flies behind the towers. 
Experts say this readies the patient for what's about to happen. Next, a plane hits the first tower, but without sound. Then the full experience. Authentic pictures and sounds taken from video shot that day. Because it's so overwhelming, it can take up to eight weeks for a patient to see this, start to finish. It allows us to take it in small steps instead of biting off more than a person can chew in therapy. Researchers say all those who've gone through VRT have responded well. The New York City Fire Department says it's familiar with the therapy and has even referred patients to the program. As for Stephen, he says he's got his life back. It really forced me to think about it and to talk about it and in opening up that maybe to understand uh, myself. By going back in time to move ahead. Okay, um, so our work started in, in 2003 with the idea that we could take an already built game that had Afghan and, and Iraqi type content in it and modify it and be able to use that. So we actually had access to the art assets for this game, Full Spectrum Warrior, and we took that street out of it. Um, we had access to it. The USC had had a hand in the development of this game. Um, and this is what it looked like. Uh, and we did it, for, we did it on, in our spare time. We had a programmer, um, yanked it out, had controls where you could hit a button and add sound, hit another button, and you'd hear gunfire. Hit another button, a helicopter would land or an insurgent would come out of the woodwork and attack. And so we didn't have any funding. But we were able to build the prototype, um, and uh, right at the time that it was done, uh, one of my former grad students was in the military, and he went to Iraq, and he took the system with him, and that's a guy in Iraq, in virtual Iraq. Um, and this was really important. It wasn't about treatment. It was about getting their feedback, and uh, one of the best takeaways from the whole talk here is that if you're going to design this stuff, you got to you got to talk to your user group. You got to have them involved in this. You can't come up with this from the ivory tower. You got to you got to start with this kind of stuff. So, this information was really important to set the stage, and we continually collect this information as we evolve the system to the current day, um, and build new things, build new features, and so forth. Um, and it was odd in 2004, before that article came out that I showed earlier. We had applied to NIH for funding to, to develop. We had the prototype. We wanted to develop the full system. And some reviewers said, oh, I don't think we're going to have the same problem we had with Vietnam. You know, I want, you know, the, it's a good thing reviewers are, are it's blinded. You don't know who, who makes these dumbass comments because, anyway. Um, but after that article came out, because we had the prototype, Office of Naval Research contacted us. They had heard about it, and they came up with the funding. And, 2005, we had all the information we needed. We knew what we needed to build, um, to start anyway. Um, and we came up with this, a four scenario version, a couple of driving scenarios, Afghan, Iraq themed, a city scenario. Uh, you could walk around interiors, rooftops, streets, and so forth. Um, the cl clinician can control everything that goes on in the simulation, hit buttons and blow things up. Um, change the time of day, the lighting, uh, and so forth. But, and th that went out for actual treatment use to about 100 sites uh, from 2006 or so to 2011 or 12. Uh, along the way, we got funding to advance the system. And we learned a heck of a lot from the clinicians and patients that went through the four scenario version. And it led to building out 14 different worlds, different content, different experiences based on what we saw as needed. Come on. By going through it there, it's not going through my head at night when I'm trying to sleep or when I'm with my wife, when times when I don't want it to, to come up and me start thinking about it. Traumatic things are not normal. You cannot handle the, the things that you've seen and done. And this is a tool that has helped me out tremendously. Reliving the worst moments of his life has helped him to move on with his life. I'm probably about 80% of who I was before I left, but I think that's pretty good after seeing and doing the things that we've done. Fortnite. Okay. Now, a key thing, again, like I said, with uh, the phobia work, you know, 
the technology, it's not VR therapy, it's VR exposure therapy. It's taking something we know in a real world that has some evidence and trying to amplify and extend the impact of that treatment and in the hands of a good clinician. I can't even imagine automating PTSD treatment uh, using this type of therapy. Uh, I think a clinician has to be involved. And so in the end, the technology is not fixing anyone. It's a tool in the hands of a well-trained clinician. Uh, and the tool operates by way of an interface. This was from the second version uh, where you can pop the person into different locations and different worlds. You can monitor physiology. You can make stuff happen. You can see what the patient sees in the headset. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, that's what the clinical interface is. That's what it looks like now with a separate screen so you can see what the client is seeing as they're going through it. Um, also, we have a smell machine. Nasty smells get pumped out. Base shaker platform where you have subwoofers, the sound rumbles through so you feel the, the motor or the Humvee or the concussive force of a bomb um, and different props along the way. In fact, one of the earliest bits of feedback we got when we sent the system to Iraq is that service members said, gamepad, okay for driving a vehicle, you can get away with that, but on a foot patrol, unnatural and distracting. So we got these fake weighted weapons, uh, fake M4s, and put a thumb mouse on it. So now the user uh, is always gonna go wherever they're looking, and the thumb mouse is like a gas pedal forward and backwards. So, quick data. First um, clinical trial, first test, you, you know, small sample to you know, determine, make sure we're not hurting anybody first off, and uh, see what the results are. And so these were folks who have been in the military for a while, multiple deployments, and they had tried some uh, form of exposure or EMDR or cognitive processing therapy, some evidence-based approach, and didn't get any benefit because we couldn't take first-time treatment because it was still experimental. Um, and we got good results, pre-treatment PTSD uh, symptoms post and a three-month follow-up, put a finer point on it. 16, no longer met PTSD criteria at the end of treatment. Four, did not benefit from it. Uh, these findings were replicated by another group up at Fort Lewis, similar results. Um, this group recently published this where they do, uh, like the previous speaker talked about a three-week intensive approach. They do the same thing. You go to Orlando, you stay there for three weeks. I'd rather go to Chicago, actually. Um, but you, you, you go and each morning you do the VR exposure. Each afternoon you do what's called trauma management therapy, which is a collection of different uh, approaches, whether it's dealing with anger or addiction or you know, more group type therapies and so forth. But that effect size is dramatic. I'd almost be embarrassed presenting it if it was my own. People would think I'm you know, fudging on the data. But I think it underscores the, the idea that um, maybe we gotta start looking at uh, post-traumatic stress kind of like you look at cancer. You know, it's like nobody wants to go through chemo or radiation, but you do it. And maybe we gotta treat PTS intensively. You know, certainly there's a motivational factor. Anybody willing to go to Orlando for three weeks, <laughs> motivated to get better. Um, but anyway, no offense to people from Orlando that are here. Um, uh, I'm just not a big fan of the tragic kingdom. Anyway, um, another study, um, uh, you know, showing results maintained a year follow-up. And also looking at physiological reactivity, the startle response tested pre, halfway through, or at the end of treatment and a six month follow up, showing a, a drop off in that. Also cortisol reactivity uh, taken from blood draws, showing that as well. Um, and another, ran and this is in a randomized controlled trial, th these results are the least impressive of, of any of the results uh, because it just showed equivalence with the um, imaginal exposure, um, but it was used in the four scenario version and a lot of the folks that were in this trial actually uh, spent a lot of time in Afghanistan rather than Iraq and we had mostly Iraq themed content. So we've got another randomized controlled trial just concluded uh, showing really good results and also an additional finding which I'll mention here. And that is the idea that, you know, whether it's better or just as good as traditional prolonged imaginal exposure, it may be something that draws people into treatment that wouldn't ordinarily seek 
uh, treatment. And we found that in the most recent randomized controlled trial where when people were given the informed consent and said, you may get the VR exposure or you may get the imaginal exposure. But if you had a choice, which would you pick? 75% would, would have opted for the VR. Of course, that meant 25% got disappointed because they got randomly assigned to imaginal. But um, so it's about breaking down barriers to care as much as it's uh, an issue with um, um, you know, the efficacy of the treatment. Now, this work spawned a whole bunch of other projects. I'm just gonna touch on a couple. Um, one is adding a drug, a relatively benign drug, an antibiotic tubercul a tuberculosis medication developed in the 50s, um, and it has a direct effect on the amygdala. So if you give it to lab animals that have been trained to fear a light or a tone, um, and you give it to them during extinction trials where that light or tone goes on and they don't get shocked, they decondition or extinguish the fear response in half the time. Um, so we just completed a trial. We're still analyzing uh, the, the clinical data on the decycloserine, um, but previous work with this drug, you only take it right before the exposure session. This is for fear of heights from 2004 where you see better results when you take the decycloserine. Um, and this was the World Trade Center uh, results, uh, another study by Joanne DeFiti. Both of these groups are VR exposure, but the bottom line there is with the decycloserine. So maybe we can speed up the, the extinction process um, and lead to better uh, results faster, which is always an important thing. Um, also looking at uh, cerebral uh, brain imaging, pre and post treatment. Um, the results showed just what you would expect, less activation in the amygdala when presented with fear stimuli, um, less activation in some areas of the frontal cortex that you would want, but more activation in other areas that serve as a modulating in influence on the limbic system. Um, so uh, positive results there. Um, then using the content as assessment so putting people in, not for treatment, but measuring their reactivity when they're in the environment. Four studies have shown the value of that approach as well for better predicting beyond self-report of symptoms. Um, finally, um, more recently, military, as mentioned in previous talk, uh, issues with uh, military sexual trauma, a big issue, and military is trying to address it. And so they funded a project where not only you know, we, we found out in a hurry that most sexual trauma in the military is not happening in the trenches of Afghanistan. It's happening around bases in the U.S. So we built a bunch of civilian content as well as modifying some of the barracks and, and locations and uh, the Afghan and Iraq things. We had a perpetrator that you could customize that would follow you around or turn up uh, and so forth. Um, and the results from that initial safety and feasibility trial uh, again, you know, you start off slow to make sure you're not hurting anybody to begin with. And uh, of 15, 11 completed the treatment, three quit before they started. They, they went to the assessment, were entered in the study, and then did, never turned up. One dropped out halfway through because she felt she was better, uh, but pretty good results uh, for a small sample there. Um, and a reasonable effect size as well. Also, heart rate reactivity, just we're, we're still looking at more nuanced uh, assessment of the psychophys, but just on, in terms of raw heart rate, when people go into one of these simulations before treatment, they're already anticipating the fear, heart rate is up, and it jumps at, by the end of the four minute exposure. Um, and at post-treatment, you see less anticipatory anxiety and less reactivity measured in this fashion. Finally, we had the idea, what about putting ourselves out of a job on the back end, treating PTSD by doing a better job on the front end, preparing service members for the emotional challenges they'll face in a combat environment. And this led to the STRIVE project. We basically took the content we built for treatment and retooled it as a pre-deployment resilience training system. And this falls in line with uh, military thinking, finally, uh, where they, they focus on this. Uh, General Casey, when Comprehensive Soldier Fitness came out, this was a published American psychologist, made the bold claim for the Army, 
psych fitness, every bit as important as physical fitness, and we need to go beyond treatment-centric to uh, enhancement of strengths and prevention. So what we did here was looked at all the content we had created as like the digital backlot at Universal Studios and created episodes where a person would put on the headset and be with a squad and go on a mission. And so, so instead of watching Band of Brothers, you're in the Band of Brothers episode. You get to know the characters, they have f very distinct personalities, um, and at the end of the mission, something bad happens. And the bad thing that happens is modeled after some of the stories we heard in therapy. Uh, you know, seeing a child die, somebody on your squad gets hit, you get hit with an IED in a vehicle. Um, and uh, up to that point, it's an emotional obstacle course. So you're, this is what you're gonna be facing. This could happen. But at that point, we have a virtual human mentor walk right into the scene and guide you through coping strategies, stress management tactics, resilience building, mindfulness, so a whole variety of tactics um, that are relevant to the context. So I'm gonna show in parallel two endpoints of these up of two of the episodes. Vehicle three. ID, drive, man. Go, go! go. This, this is vehicle three. Go, we just go, got hit. Go. We're down. We're down. Oh so you get the idea, and then what happens, the emotional obstacle course, um, we bring in all these tactics that were developed for comprehensive soldier fitness and a whole variety of other things, um, and have it delivered by a mentor. So after you got hit with the IED in the vehicle, everybody gets out, and he's standing by the side of the road and says, okay, come on in here, and you go into some ramshackle hut, and it's a briefing room, and I'm just gonna show some slices. These, these episodes, the, the, the narrative goes five to seven minutes, and the post uh, thing with the mentor goes five, seven, sometimes 10 minutes. Let's start with learning how your body reacts to stress. The caveman part of your brain, the amygdala, goes into action. Its job is to identify threats. If the crap you're in is real, the caveman starts beating his drums, sending signals throughout your body, telling it to get ready. I work with a sergeant who stayed amped after serious encounters, sometimes for days. Not good. When you get a chance to lower your guard, you want to make sure you help your body recover from the stress response that was initiated. One way of doing this is through a simple breathing exercise. It can help calm your heart, normalize your breathing, decrease blood pressure, and help you sleep. Let's try it a couple more times. Breathe in silently through your nose deep into your belly. Now slowly exhale from your They're mouth. They're a very simple breathing exercise to deal with, you know, an acute stress response. But we have much more complex things as the threats become more complex. We thought we could build 30 episodes, but our funding ran out after six. So uh, currently, there's, we, don't, we haven't done the serious randomized controlled trial because it's so difficult. You'd have to split a unit and in half randomly assign people to get this or the traditional stress resilience training um, and then follow them after they go on multiple deployments, look at their combat exposure. Uh, so we haven't done that, but we're also looking at physiology here. And in one study, when people were going through this, uh, we showed that the simulation activity was activating, that people did get emotionally engage with it and have a reaction when the bad thing happened. And also, um, as part of a larger resilience study, uh, we got good buy-in by service members, both people who had never been deployed, but also people who had been on multiple deployments, weighing in about whether they thought it was useful, it was realistic, whether they would apply some of these tactics uh, and so forth. So uh, we're still waiting to do the grand study, but I don't know wh when that's gonna happen. It'll probably happen when we can start to deliver these this type of content on a mobile standalone headset. So every soldier, when they go to boot camp, they get their gun, their backpack, their helmet. Oh, here's your Oculus Go or Samsung Gear preloaded with 60 training episodes covering a variety of topics. And so people can do it independently. Anyway, um, the next step is civilian translation. We got two projects, one with LA police and one with New York City police um, to start to look at that population in the urban battlefield. Um, 
And just to close, um, these are basic takeaways. You can safely do this with people with anxiety disorders, PTS. It's VR exposure, not VR therapy. Um, you know, it's delivering something we already know, not some magical VR treatment. Um, is good or is as good or better than imaginal exposure. It doesn't have to be an exact replica uh, to have a treatment effect. It's a tool to extend skills of clinicians that are well trained. Military R&D drove uh, the technology for civilian use, and I think that in the near future it's going to become more readily available. Now, I got five more minutes of stuff if you want to see it. Uh, I know I'm over the time, and you guys have been here all day, but I can finish in five if, if you guys are okay. All right, all right, all right, cool. All right, so. Um, I want to thank some of our sponsors here that uh, have donated equipment here. Um, anyway, all right, so the third eye, I didn't talk about that before, imagination. And uh, I just want to touch on it real quick to close here. Um, in VR, there's been plenty of imagination, and even going back to 1963 with a wearable television being labeled as a dumb invention, uh, people have been envisioning this for a long time. In the 90s, this is what we were hoping, to get inside the computer, get in the simulation. Uh, the reality was that, you know, head-mounted displays were horrible, bad resolution, limited field of view, heavy, uncomfortable. Um, it, was, it just wasn't ready for prime time. But then this guy, Palmer Lucky, who worked in our lab before doing his Kickstarter, managed to pull $3 billion out of Facebook to build Oculus. He's no longer with Oculus anymore. He's doing some other crazy thing. But um, that really was a game changer. All that money and all that interest and the advances in the technology has led to all kinds of applications and all kinds of equipment changes that um, have really made a difference so that it's feasible. When you can go up on Amazon and have your pick of headsets, um, the barriers to adoption are, are significantly lowered now. Um, also, interface devices, ways for people to interact in these virtual worlds. That is growing. Uh, people with imaginative ideas uh, doing things to try to make it more realistic uh, for interaction. Um, you know, certainly a few harebrained schemes turn up every once in a while, but there's no doubt the public consciousness has uh, embraced VR um, and applications in different ways. A lot of overhyped, overwrought claims and some downright negative things. There's a, certainly a backlash about VR. Um, and, uh, you know, the virtual reality dream is waning. Well, it may be in some ways for gaming. I don't think uh, gamers are adopting VR as anticipated. But if all the technology development stop tomorrow. We have sufficient technology to do mental health and rehab. Uh, it's already there. So, you know, good luck in the game industry. Hope people make a lot of money and create novel experiences, great. But we're good when it comes to, um, you know, when it comes to having the tools to be able to do the things we want to do. Um, finally, looking into the future here, um, you guys ever see this thing, uh, the Gartner Group hype cycle of technology? It's charts technology from the, the innovation trigger and then best things in sliced bread time, you know, and then the trough of disillusionment where, you know, it isn't as good as we thought it would be. Well, VR lived in that trough ever since I started working in it. And every year when this thing would come out, I'd, oh, the Gartner Group hype cycle's out, go online, VR is still stuck in the trough until 1917, and finally it's moving up the slope of enlightenment towards the plateau of productivity. Um, we we're also seeing big predictions about its use. Of course, everybody says games and entertainment, and that's the biggest share of the potential market, but look what comes in second, healthcare. Um, neuroscientists are adopting it, hardcore neuroscientists adopting video games, VR, because, uh, again, it's the ultimate Skinner box, a controlled stimulus environment that we can do good research, good brain research. Clinicians are starting to get the point in this study that took psychotherapy experts and asked them to rate things that are going to have the most impact in therapy over the next 10 years. 
Um, VR came a fourth out of 45 options, and four of the other top four, three of the other top four uh, were tech-based, uh, teletherapy, online CBT, and mobile phone apps. Um, and companies are popping up everywhere. This is a company virtually better, been around since 1995. This is a short list of companies that have popped up in the last couple of years, more in the last couple of years than in the previous 20. Um, events, really good event if you're in Amsterdam. Uh, I highly recommend going to that event. But you're already at this one. Virtual medicine goes on in March down in Los Angeles. That one just finished in Gatineau. This is a really good one if you're focused on, um, on more rehab uh, things, uh, physical and occupational therapy, neuropsychology, things like that. And finally, you know, is it for kids? There's some question about it. But the, the couple weeks after I got my first Gear VR, I flew back home to Connecticut, and my niece and nephew, you know, it's like, you want to try this? And I had to pry it away from them. They were having fights over it, even though people say, oh, you shouldn't put young kids in this stuff. They loved it, okay? But it's not just for the young at heart. As you'll see here, on that same trip, oh, come on. On the same trip, I got in late. I flew in, and my flight was delayed. Three in the morning, my mom's waiting up for me. I go, Mom, you gotta try this. So it's so real. My God, it looks like my backyard, my yard with the snow. Oh, Lord in heaven. How they ever can create this. You know what? I'm hanging on to the sink because I'm afraid I'm gonna fall down down the cliff. <laughs> yeah, honest to God. You feel like, oh. You, you, if you step off, you're going to fall right in there. Holy mackerel. And finally, one last bit. If you're watching this, please fund my son's research so that he can take care of me. Not opinion. like a pitch for mom. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, this talk will be freely available. Send me an email. I'll post it online. And if anybody wants any of the content or any papers, just uh, send me an email. And uh, thanks for your time. Thank you so much.